Dear friends, who come to be encouraged by the Word of God and by your Savior, Jesus Christ. In the last verse of the hymn that we just sang, we sang this, Now rise, faint hearts, be resolute. This man is Christ, our substitute. That word substitute, as it applies to Jesus, is a very profound, profound word and a profound statement as to who Jesus is and what he has done for us. I'd like to start out this morning just by talking a little bit about substitutes and substitutions. We talk a lot about substitutions in, in various parts of, of our lives. We talk about substitute teachers, right? A substitute teacher comes into the classroom because the regular teacher, something has happened. Maybe the teacher went on vacation or the teacher is sick and couldn't make it to work, um, something like that. Or maybe the teacher was doing such a bad job that the teacher got fired and they needed a, a substitute teacher for a while to, to fill in. We talk about substitutions in sports quite a bit. The players are out there on the field and somebody gets really hurt and they're taken off of the field. And so a substitution is called in to play that position for that player and hopefully to be able to, to do it better than that player. Sometimes substitutions come in not because a player is hurt and has to leave the game, but sometimes a substitution is called in because a particular player was just doing such a bad job that the coach said, I gotta pull you out and put somebody else in because maybe they can do a better job than, than you can. Substitutions abound. They abound even in the foods that we eat. If you are diabetic, you know all about substitutions because when you're making different things, you have to substitute different things for different ingredients in order so that you survive, right? And sometimes those substitutions might be really good and sometimes uh, you know, they, they might not be as, as good as, as the original. But you always are playing in this world with substitutions in various forms. Well, Jesus Christ came as a substitute. He came as our substitute. He came to substitute for us because like a teacher who is doing such a poor job or a player who is doing such a poor job, we, by all rights, God says, I got to take you out of the game. I got to take you out of the classroom because you do a poor job of being a righteous person like I demand. And so he sent Jesus Christ into the world to be our substitute. Now generally speaking, when we talk about Jesus being our substitute, probably the first thing that comes to our mind is, yes, Jesus was my substitute when he died on the cross to pay for my sins. Up on the cross, substitute because what we realize as Christians is that it's us that should be up there on the cross, not Jesus, right? Because on Jesus took upon himself was the wrath and the punishment of God over sin, over our sin. And yet Jesus Christ came into this world, the perfect Lamb of God who never committed any sin, and the wrath and punishment of God over sin. And so often when we think about Jesus as our substitute, we think about it most primarily in that work that he did for us on the cross. But Jesus as our substitute isn't just limited to his death on the cross. Jesus as our substitute is really the whole life and work of Jesus in toto. Not just Jesus. So every day that Jesus Christ lived here on this earth, he was living as your and my substitute. Because he lived the perfect life that you and I fail miserably to live. And one of the places that we see Jesus Christ as our perfect substitute is in his baptism in the Jordan River. At the very start of his earthly ministry, when he was about 30 years old and he was going to start going out and proclaiming himself to be the Christ and take that road and that walk down to Jerusalem and up to Mount Calvary, Jesus wanted to declare to everybody 
that he was the Messiah, the one that was promised of old in all the Old Testament, and that he was the one that was even now living the perfect life as the perfect substitute for the whole world, you and me included. And so let's take a look at Jesus' baptism in the Jordan River and see him as our substitute and wean from this what it means that Jesus, first of all, was our substitute, but also how it affects our lives. If you take out your bulletin, our lesson for today is from Matthew chapter 3. Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to be baptized by John. This is John the Baptist, the forerunner of the Christ. But John tried to deter him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? Jesus replied, let it be so now. It is proper for us to do this, to fulfill all righteousness. Then John consented. We're going to stop right there, and we'll take the, the next part in just a little bit. But here we have this, this setup. John the Baptist, the forerunner of Jesus Christ, is down at the Jordan River, and he is baptizing people. John came with a message of repentance and baptism for the forgiveness of sins. And so the people came to him, and they repented of their sins. They confessed that they were sinful human beings and that they needed forgiveness of sins. And John took them to the Jordan River, and he baptized them for the cleansing away of their sins. And this was a good and a proper thing for them to do because it's something that God ordained. He said, John, I want you to go and I want you to preach this baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And so that's what he did. And so the people came to be baptized by John. And they said, I am a sinful human being and I need forgiveness from my God. And John baptized them. And they had that assurance from God that their sins were paid for, were forgiven. And then John went and, and, and he saw Jesus and he said, see, that's the one that's going to fulfill all this. It's in his work, John said, that I baptize you. Because when he comes, he's coming to baptize you with the Holy Spirit. And there you're going to have that absolute assurance that your sins are forgiven because of the work and the ministry of this one, Jesus Christ, for your sins. And so then John, Jesus shows up at the Jordan River. And he comes down and he says, all right, John, everybody's coming to be baptized as is proper, so I need to be baptized. And John says the most profound thing that he probably could and the absolute correct thing that he probably could. He looks at Jesus Christ and he says, are you kidding me? <laughs> you, you want me to baptize you, Jesus? No, 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 that can't be right. That can't be right because Jesus... Baptism is for sinners. Baptism is for people who need to confess their sins and need forgiveness. And John recognized that Jesus Christ had no sin. There was no reason for Jesus to be baptized because baptism wasn't for perfect people. Baptism was for sinners. He says, no, 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 no. You should be baptizing me, John says, because that's, that's the better way to go. Have the perfect one announcing that forgiveness of sins to the imperfect, not the imperfect one, baptizing the perfect one. And so we wonder, and we scratch our heads with John the Baptist and say, well, that's true. Baptism is something for sinners to wash away their sin. Then why on earth would Jesus Christ, the perfect, sinless Lamb of God, be coming to be baptized? Well, Jesus tells us why he came to be baptized. He said, let us do this now because it is proper to fulfill all righteousness. And with these words, Jesus Christ announces to John the Baptist and to us that substitutionary work that he was doing for us. You see, Jesus didn't need to be baptized. He was sinless. And yet he said, I need to be baptized, not for me and for my sin. I need to be baptized because this is all part 
of the working of God's plan for the salvation of all people. See, I said earlier that a lot of times when we talk about Jesus being the substitute, we think about it being that, that passive obedience where he, just, where he hung on the cross and he just received the wrath of God for our sins. But Jesus' work encompasses so much more than that. It also encompasses the perfect life that God demands from every single person. See, our salvation is based not just on the forgiveness of our sins, our salvation is also based on the perfect life of Jesus Christ. Because God's demand for people to go to heaven is that you must be perfect as I, the Lord your God, am perfect. That is his demand for every single person on earth for all time. You must be perfect, even as I am perfect, he says. And when we look at our lives and we measure it up according to God's demand, we say, I have failed to be righteous. I have not fulfilled all righteousness to get me to heaven. And so we need not only Jesus' perfect death on our behalf, but we also need Jesus' perfect life on our behalf to fulfill all those righteous requirements of God for us. The whole work of Jesus Christ is a substitutionary work. What He does is given to us. And so Jesus says, no, I don't need to be baptized for my own sin. I need to be baptized because it's all part of God's whole plan for salvation. And so I'm going to do every little bit. Because the fact of the matter is, Jesus Christ didn't have to do anything for us, did he? He didn't have to come to earth as a human being and live here on earth and be tempted here on earth as we are and suffer here on earth for us. He didn't have to do any of that. But in his love, he did do that. And he came down to earth as a true human being, the Son of God, to live perfectly for us. And so his baptism was part of that perfect life that we need, that perfect righteousness that we need in order to get to heaven. 